So we already got quite a few excellent, excellent questions that have come in. Um, so maybe you could comment, Larry, uh, on the following question. Uh, in 2034, China is expected to stop selling uh, platinum group elements to the rest of the world and their prices will rise dramatically. In 2025, expected increases in rare earth element demand is up 210,000 tons uh, for oxides. Can you comment on some of these future dynamics? So if I understand the question correctly, the first part was about platinum group elements, um, which China is not a major source for. Um, the, the second part was about rare earth elements, and China is a major source for that, both in terms of primary uh, production and in terms of processing and availability. Um, the question of how available they will be to the rest of the world um, is something that is unknown. It is possible that it may decrease or be interrupted, and that certainly uh, will be of concern for many people around the world, uh, both in the manufacturing sectors and, and others. Um, so I don't have any particular expertise on those projections, but uh, I can comment on the ability to locate new supplies of these new resources and that's a matter of simple economics. The total amount used for the rare earth elements um, is very, very small, um, less than probably a day's worth of value of production of, of a major commodity like iron or copper. So there's really not a big driver in the international exploration community uh, to explore for more of these resources. That could be changed by government actions or other um, institutions, but right now it seems unlikely the market is going to respond in the short term to changes in that supply. Thank you. Um, so Nelly, a question for you. Uh, I appreciate Dr. Munamari's uh, emphasis on policy and regulation, but her framework doesn't mention consent whether free prior informed consent recognized in the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples or community consent. Can you co comment on this role of consent uh, within your framework? Uh, no, thank you very much. That's a very good question. Um, I, I think that um, perhaps I suffered from not having enough time to talk to everything that's important for sustainable development in terms of mineral extraction. But you're absolutely right, it's very important. And I think where you might find in what I presented, where that is implied, is in when, when I talk about the inclusivity that must happen when one is actually formulating mineral policy, which is the basis of regulation or the law and regulation. Um, a good practice around formulating those policies is ensuring that uh, all stakeholders included, and that includes indigenous peoples, and hence their, the, their need to be recognized in the process of mineral exploitation from exploration all the way to, to the benefit sharing. Uh, should actually come through as the mining policy actually be, being developed and hence the good practices that you find that a lot of the new mining regimes are actually recognizing that um, and it's also reflected in terms of the good practices that these policies are actually aligning themselves with. If you look at, for example, uh, the the IFC uh, performance standards or some of the standards that the, uh, or, or of, uh, with regards to ethical exploitation, you will find, for example, that uh, most of the good regimes will have uh, a requirement to do not just environmental social impact assessment. Uh, environmental impact assessment, but also includes social impact assessments, in which case the, uh, the, 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 the consultation of indigenous peoples, of local communities that will be impacted by an exploration or exploitation project actually have to be taken into account. The last part of my presentation that kind of in, implies the importance of communities is the last slide where I spoke about community development agreements. And that's not just it after the, the mineral uh, right is granted, but right all the way from exploitation, exploration to say a community should be consulted when somebody or investor comes and say they actually want to apply for a, an exploration license, in which case their permission and their consent has to be part of the, of the process if we're actually following good practice. I hope that uh, responds to the question. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so this one's for, I think, probably for you, you Larry. Um, what do you see as sort of the scope in the future of, you know, developing resources for subst substitution metals, uh, you know, to address those that are in high demand or, you know, certainly are considered critical minerals? 
Um, that certainly is a topic of active research, um, particularly in industry, um, trying to find elements that are more, I think the phrase is earth abundant is what they use. Uh, they just mean they're, they're more available um, from many different sources um, for things that are very specialized. However, there's some fundamental constraints here in that the chemistry and physics of these elements and the properties that they have, they're used for a reason. So if you want something to conduct electricity, then the ability to conduct electricity has to be a fundamental driver of the, the use of a particular metal or commodity rather than people's desire to have some other thing substitute for it. So yes, there is a general uh, push to find substitutions for some of these elements, but many of them have properties that make them, if not unique, at least really worthwhile for use in a particular application. Okay. Um, Nellie, a question for you. Um, do sustainable clean mineral export exploitation networks and adequate labeling currently exist? And if so, you know, in which mineral resources, uh, you know, are those networks established? Um, this particular individual indicates that they, they have an interest in developing such labeling systems for use within the geopark concept. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Actually, it's a, it's a very uh, lively um, area of, of uh, the sustainable development, and this is linked to uh, what I mentioned in my presentation around responsible mineral supply chain. So there are different aspects in which uh, responsible mineral supply chains uh, actually are seen and dealt with. One is just, just being a responsible uh, investor with regard to how you exploit minerals. But at the same time, they are also, in particular, this is mainly driven by uh, some international protocols that require that there is due diligence that is shown around mineral production. Uh, for example, you have the US Dodd Frank Act and you have the that just coming in EU regulation on conflict minerals. What that requires is of, uh, of companies that are registered within certain jurisdictions to actually show due diligence that the minerals that they're actually um, uh, involved in terms of the supply chain are not tainted by unethical practices like uh, gender-based violence or child labor or funding conflict and such like. And there are um, uh, systems and, 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 and standards that relate to spe some specific minerals. I think one of the earliest ones, I think if uh, we all know about blight diamonds is the Kimberley process certification scheme, which leads to diamonds. Then you have uh, within the Great Lakes regions of Africa, you have something called the ICGLR, International uh, uh, government, International Conference on Governmental Regions, which has a mineral certification scheme that tries to deal with the, uh, what's called the three T's, which is tin, tungsten, and tantalite and gold. Uh, then you also have uh, some other uh, commodities, particularly around the battery minerals that are linked to the smelters. Then uh, some other uh, frameworks are linked to just broad. Uh, responsible exploitation of minerals. For example, you have something called Fair Mind, uh, which which deals uh, with minerals in the same way that uh, you know we've dealt with cocoa and, and tea and coffee, um, and and you can buy a product that uh, has been certified as having been produced uh, in ethical in an ethical way. Um, so with your geopark, I think it depends on the minerals that are found there. Um, but if there is no specific scheme that certifies that, but I think there's also just general due diligence and general ethical production uh, that is guided by, by uh, certain standards um, of, of uh, exploitation of minerals that one could actually apply to a geopark. Thank you. So this next question, I think uh, it'd be interesting to hear from, uh, from both of you. Um, do you think that there is a potential to establish policy whereby we partially or fully conceal new resource discoveries and record those discoveries within the strategic government framework to be used in the future. And it, with, you know, basically without this being put out on the market, uh, would it potentially push folks to more judicious use of, of, of existing resources? Go ahead, Nellie. 
Okay, all right. I think when when I was thank you, Larry. When I was uh, uh, listening to that that uh, question or comment, um, what came to my mind is a comment that I had been um, uh, made by somebody who is um, in quotation anti mining. I'm not trying to be direct or anything. Where the statement was, if we can't mine it responsibly, let's leave it in the ground until we can actually do it properly. Um, so I think that it really depends on which side of the of the fence you're sitting. I think if you're uh, coming from uh, uh, a developed uh, economy where your your uh, GDP is not so dependent on the extraction of minerals, I think it's quite easy to actually say let's seal them and leave them for the future. But if you're coming from a developing economy that is relying on extracting those resources, then I think you might see that as a, perhaps an unfair. Uh, way to, to to actually approach because that, that that might be the only asset that you have to actually develop your own your your economy. Uh, so I think it really depends on 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 which side uh, of, of the fence you're sitting. I don't know if you want to come in. Um, this is a very interesting and complex question that has at least three or four different layers to it. So one part of it is developing some sort of, of inventory or um, record of what resources are out there so that one could make decisions possibly about which should be developed and in what order and how, how fast. Um, and that's a really interesting concept um, and it's built on um, the need to actually discover things. And if it's not possible to put something into production, it's not clear what the economic driver is for somebody to spend money to go find it. Um, the alternative, of course, would be um, some sort of, of governmental or other institution um, doing exploration to find things. Um, and that would be another uh, approach to it. Uh, the point that Nelly brings up about people's uh, varying need and reliance on different mineral resources is, is quite important. And it's not only the point that she brings up about the reliance of an economy upon that, but also the disconnect between people's, um, how should we phrase it, uh, philosophy of use relative to what they're actually doing. So to say we should leave it in the ground when you are in fact using things like a smartphone or a television that is using those same materials, there's a incompatibility there between those two uh, philosophies or actions. And this is something that society has not been very good at, getting people to reconcile the fact that they are the consumers of this. And if their desire is not to consume it, perhaps the first action might be to change their consumption habits. Thank you. So a question for you, Nelly. Uh, ASM can be as uh, associate with, uh, as, sorry, uh, ASM can be associated with, with basically, you know, very disorderly extractive practices, um, you know, such as some of the, you know, the, the artisanal gold mining, for instance, in, in Brazil and the Amazon. Is there a way to get those benefits while avoiding some of the negative side effects of it? Yeah, so, so the, the ASM uh, sector, particularly the artisanal part of the ASM sector is, is very complicated. And I think at the at the base of it is that um, it is associated with, with a lot of socioeconomic issues. Um, so so it's, it's not, there's no silver bullet to solving the issues of ASM. Uh, but some of the thinking, um, and there's been, but there's been a lot of progress that has been made in trying to to address the challenges. At the same time, you also have some advances with regards to how people are exploiting the sector uh, in a very, very negative way, as the example in, in that is being given in the Amazon. But the the positive um, steps that have been made towards uh, trying to address some of the negative challenges that come with the ASM sector are uh, to do with the attempt to formalize because a lot of the ASM is actually happening outside the formal or mainstream uh, economies and hence it is um, 
vulnerable to some of the unethical and 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 practices that are not compatible with sustainable development. So it, so there are efforts, for example, with with uh, the gold mining in the Amazon, specifically, and some of the impacts that actually come from, for example, the use of mercury. There are many programs that are trying to to try and address this. One of them is the UNEP program on on mercury uh, emissions linked to the Minamata Convention on Mercury Pollution, which is trying to help countries that have artisanal gold mining that where the artisanal miners use mercury to help them move away from using mercury and you actually uh, use uh, technology that are mercury free. So it's a, it's a very big challenge and there are no simple solutions, but just to ask him to say that there are a lot of efforts around formalization of the ASM sector because there is a realization that there are many, many uh, poor communities that rely on ASM as a livelihood. Uh, yet at the same time, recognizing that it's a sector that uh, is associated with a lot of negative things. And I think one of the challenges is, is around illicit uh, uh, trade in minerals, which then uh, involves some not so small operators. I mean, you, if you, you look at the trade in, in gold, for example, where gold ends up in some of the big economies, uh, though it starts with uh, simple little activities, what is not mine. So it's a very complex um, subject, uh, which uh, I think is the subject of a whole series of lecture on its own. But I hope I've I responded a little bit to what the question that has been raised. Thank you. Um, so, Larry, uh, given the focus on electrification of transportation for all kinds of various reasons, can you comment on approaches to managing mineral availability for various supply chains? in particular domestic supply chains, if, for example, numerous countries or regions attempt uh, to secure the supplies uh, at the same time for the foreseeable future? Well, you're really talking about international cooperation um, and government structures, which is a, a very complicated and almost philosophical discussion about how societies should be organized. Um, it's fairly straightforward to go to markets and determine you know, what price you want for a commodity and what people are willing to pay for it. But the idea of trying to coordinate um, among either suppliers um, or consumers of various commodities um, is difficult. We have various um, international agreements. The World Trade Organization would probably be the, the simplest one to point to to try to coordinate some of these uh, policies so that things like tariffs um, and, and restrictions don't unduly uh, impede the, the use of commodities in a particular country. But such international agreements are you know, difficult to, to come by. It's been true throughout human history. And so how this will develop in the future, um, I simply do not know. So we have a question for both of you uh, from a uh, professor at East Carolina University. Um, considering the aspects that uh, the, the presentations uh, discussed today, what do you think should be the direction of current and near future education and geology from the traditional teaching to one immersed in sustainable development? And are there guidelines for updating geology programs to sort of hit the scope of, of the future that both of you are discussing? Yeah, so if you want, I can go ahead first, Larry. Um, I think the, the thing that comes to my mind is when I, I'm very old, when I went to school uh, to study geology, which was like straight geology. Um, and one of the challenges that I found when I got into the marketplace or into the workplace is that I had no understanding about all the other um, issues that relate to geology or to mineral extraction and all related disciplines that are uh, that that kind of uh, around the, the the subject of geology or the discipline of geology. So I think that the 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 adaptation or the inclusion of uh, uh, issues that relate to to for example around uh, uh, communities around the impacts of of mineral extraction in terms of socioeconomic impacts as well as environmental impacts, um, I think are very important to be included in, 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 uh, in geology programs. One of the things that um, I've been involved in 
is uh, on a UNESCO project is to try and bring in, for example, one subject that I'm very interested in is that it's small scale mining, is to say we are producing graduates who become geologists for large mining companies or who become regulators that have no understanding of the specific issues around the small scale mining sector, uh, but are more geared towards what has been considered mainstream mining, which is the large scale industrial scale mining. So including aspects of uh, the issues that socioeconomic issues that relate to, or even technical issues that relate specifically to the small scale mining sector uh, is very important, I think, for the geology programs. And I think that the same can be said for, for other disciplines around geology. Larry? Um, this is an excellent question, and I'm strongly supportive of the implication that um, people need to be broadly educated um, beyond any particular technical um, expertise. Um, that being said, uh, there's obviously a concern about not getting <laughs> the original <laughs> technical expertise in the first place. Um, and there's a couple different approaches to this. One is to incorporate into the geology curriculum um, other types of, of courses. And the question arises, should that be done within, say, the geology department or utilizing the expertise in other departments, such as having students uh, take courses in economics or sociology or law or business? There's a lot of different disciplines. In the United States, we have colleges that are called liberal arts colleges that actually use this as their overall approach, making sure that students are broadly educated in a variety of subjects in addition to having expertise in some narrower subset. Um, but it really gets into the uh, organization of, of universities and the educational system. And there's lots of models around the world, uh, different approaches to it. But I personally really enjoy the interdisciplinary and the broad exposure to a variety of subjects, something I like doing. Great. Um, so Nelly, actually, one second. Um, it's so, you know, Nelly, you know, you, you, and, and I think this is really for both of you. Um, uh, can you comment on the concept of the limits of, of growth uh, further, you know, we understand that there's little risk of uh, running out of various materials, but at some point the negative impact of extraction and cost would limit that resource. Uh, I work in hydrogeology and an analogy of this would be groundwater mining. At, at some point the cost of getting the water limits use. Um, yeah, I can dive <laughs> into this. Um, it, it's a really important subject and um, one way of thinking about this is the uh, phrase the stone age did not end because we ran out of stones and so if you think of the various epochs of, of humanity the iron age and the bronze age and the stone age um, we have transitioned from these not because of resource exhaustion but because of evolution and how we, we use things and so I think the same thing uh, will occur with any particular uh, resource. Um, the questioner brings up uh, groundwater, and that is another one we, we could talk about. Um, the consequences of use, as I mentioned in my talk, are really, really important. And that's almost certainly going to be a more limiting factor than the availability of a, a resource. And it's something that as society, we tend to not do proactively, but uh, reactionary. Okay, we wait until there's a problem and then we try to, to solve that problem. So trying to figure out not only what we're going to use, but the consequences of that and what does the future look like? Um, somebody else has raised a question previously about the electrification of, of vehicles and how that's going to change uh, supply chains and what elements are needed. And that's absolutely true, and it's pretty easy to model some general trends about what we're going to need more of, such as lithium and cobalt um, in the future, um, versus things that you might describe as, as old technology, where we won't probably need as much of those commodities. So an excellent question. Nelly, you have yeah. a question? I, there, there, the question just came in for you that I think would be interesting. Sure. Um, 
so ASM is often depicted as a dangerous activity conducted out of desperation, including issues such as child labor, environmental impacts, and lack of safety. In your presentation, you seem to see ASM as, as, as a, one of the key ways forward in local and national benefit in mining. Uh, could you just give a, an example, a positive example of, of ASM that could be uh, used? Yeah, yeah. So, so if if you just look uh, simplistically at as um, if you are uh, somebody from a poor rural community um, and you're looking for a livelihood and um, you have minerals, um, that the availability of that uh, natural asset immediately changes your the trajectory of your life. So that's the simplest um, and for it makes the most basic. Um, way to look at and, and, uh, mineral uh, resources and the, the um, availability as a livelihood asset. The other way um, uh, to look at um, ASM uh, in terms of some of the positive things around it is that there is an assumption that um, all, or at least the, that's the perception that I get, that a lot of the minerals that we use in in in, uh, in, in production in industry are uh, sourced from large scale mining. But as I indicated in my in my uh, in my presentation, there are some economies where all mining is ASM. Uh, in this particular example that I have, where it's done reasonably, um, uh, responsibly, and 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 with a certain level of approach to sustainability, is in Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda is, uh, I think, the, probably the third or second largest producer of one of the three tea uh, minerals. And yet, to all intents and purposes, the mining sector is ASM. Uh, but the way that the government has approached uh, managing that sector, um, uh, even though, yes, there are some challenges, but they are not as big as challenges that you would find in some countries where uh, ASM is associated with like really bad social um, and environmental impacts. So there are examples of the production of, 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 of minerals that are, are linked, particularly the provision of livelihoods to poor communities. And there are a lot of efforts around responsible mining or responsible sourcing, um, where the minerals actually make a huge difference in the lives of, of uh, for rural communities, and there are um, uh, programs which are trying to ensure that the sourcing is, is as responsible as possible. And there are quite a few, um, including some that are driven from the uh, OECD, OECD judicial guidance. There is a, uh, uh, the regional certification mechanism uh, in the Great Lakes region of Africa that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they, um, there is uh, responsible refineries products, there's smelters, responsible smelters programs uh, for minerals that are sourced from uh, the ASM sector. Uh, a lot of them in Africa, some in, in, in Latin America, where you also have a lot of artisanal mining. So yeah, there is, unfortunately, there's, the face is very negative, but even when one looks, one actually finds some uh, positive examples of where ASM is being done responsibly. Thank you. So Larry, you know, what do you see as has been the major impacts of COVID-19 on criticality assessment of commodities, uh, things like accelerating the increased in demand for electrical devices or protection of leases, slow investments for mining projects. You know, what do you think some of the major impacts have been? Um, there actually was a very interesting survey uh, done by one of the, the sponsors of this lecture series at um, ICRAG in, in Ireland of the minerals industries and the effect of COVID upon operations. Um, and that was published. You could probably Google it quite um, easily. Um, and it looked at the effect of uh, the pandemic upon not only uh, production and tried to break it down in terms of the, the people effects and the material effects. And there certainly has been an impact. Um, most resource production um, was able to largely continue um, by very careful monitoring of, of, of people and practices. And we have some experience with this with previous um, diseases, particularly Ebola uh, in Africa, um, which was in an area that had much more mining activity. Um, so th there has been a major impact um, in terms of people's lives, but Remarkably, the actual supply chain um, has come through uh, relatively robustly um, and continuing to supply most of what people need. Thank you. 
Well, I would, uh, you know, like to be respectful of everyone's time as we have actually uh, uh, gone past our scheduled end time. And I apologize for uh, all the questions that we have not been able to get to. Uh, we, we have uh, dozens and dozens of uh, additional questions. But I would like to, uh, um, again, thank our speaker, speakers, uh, Larry and Nelly, uh, for great presentations and a great Q&A. And I'd like to thank everyone for an outstanding discussion. Uh, please have a, a good, uh, good rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.